Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the 20 something, if uh, maybe 21st or 22nd episode of the ABT Time podcast. Uh, it is three o'clock in the afternoon in California, which means that in Melbourne, Australia, it is 8 a.m., and my co host, Dr. Jen Martin, is joining us. How's it going down there, Jen? Good morning, Randy. Oh, look, we're just having the most glorious spring weather in Melbourne and sunshine just makes everything better. And I've got my warm cup of tea. I'm excited about today's conversation. Things are good, my friend. And how's the lockdown going? Oh, you know, it's going. In Melbourne, we have a saying that the, the worst part of a, of a one week lockdown is the first four months. So... Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, all righty. Well, we've got a um, wonderful episode today. And in fact, um, you know, with these episodes, we've done a bunch that have been really funny and fun and entertaining and interesting. Uh, I would say today we've only really done one that I would necessarily call important, which was the one that we did on how to teach the ABT. That really is a resource that I think I find myself copying and sending out to a lot of people if you want to know how to go about actually teaching the ABT. We had seven or eight of us on that episode. But I think today's episode has the potential to also be uh, important in, in a lot of ways. We're going to get into uh, a lot of climate stuff. And our wonderful guest that we've got with us is Dr. John Sturman. I'm going to be bringing him in on about in about 10 minutes, but I'm going to give a little bit of setup here to put everything into context. So I've known John for, oh, maybe uh, 12, 13 years, something like that. He is a professor at MIT. He is the Jay Forrester Professor of Management. And by the way, John, once I'm done with all this 10 minute intro, you can come in and correct all the things. It seems to be becoming a tradition here for the guests to come in and correct all the mistakes I make in the intro. But uh, he's with the School of Management there, the Sloan School of Management, at MIT, and, and background in economics and policy and things like that. And, you know, I got a feeling, and you can correct this if I'm wrong, but this is kind of his one of his most important overall messages that he'll be here to talk to us about um, that research shows that showing people research doesn't work and that sort of points in the direction of what he has developed over the past decade or so is this incredible climate interactive model that's it's very large very important we'll be getting into a lot of detail on it something he's run with the un and with the um, members of congress and at the the cop uh, conferences for climate and all sorts of things like that so very large scale uh, project. And there are two major dimensions that I connect with John on. So first off is climate communication. And here's a little bit of history there, which is 2008, he had a paper in science. I'm going to tell you about it in, in a little bit of detail in a minute or two. I got in touch with him. That paper, I am still such a huge fan of, and it's about climate communication. And then I got in touch with him. And then in 2010, we did a, for Earth Day, we did a screening of my movie, Sizzle, a global warming comedy at MIT and it was a big screening. We had a post screening panel discussion. He was on the panel. And at the panel, he said, You know, what you ought to do tomorrow if you're still around is come to my climate interactive simulation exercise. We're going to be doing it here at MIT for uh, Earth Day. And I did. And there were probably 40 or 50 people that day took part in it. And it was powerful and tremendous. And I've been a huge fan of that and of John ever since then. So that's again what we're going to be getting into more depth. And that's the second part is what he does. Um, but, you know, he kind of opened the door for me with his uh, critique of communication, which I connected on. And then that led me into taking interest in what he's doing, this climate interactive simulation. So let me go into a little more detail on the first one in particular, climate communication. And, and this paper that he had, short paper in Science 2008, here's the background on it, which is that, um, well, actually, before I even get to that paper, this just yesterday, we did the first session of the 17th round of the ABT framework course, 30 uh, fisheries biologists in this particular round. And I dove in a little bit on this as part of the introduction this time. Uh, the, the idea of the large scale pattern of where we've gone as a society, which is that we've gotten worse at communication, not better. And I think that if you ask the average person, you know, are we better at communication today than before? Everybody says, oh, of course we are. That, that just isn't true. And here's one milestone along the way. 1975, short paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, titled Medical Obfuscation Structure and Function. And the author of this was a postdoctoral fellow at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. And very simple little thing uh, he did. He took a, one issue of the journal, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, um, read three papers in there, and then put together a list of the 10 most common characteristics in the writing style of these papers that resulted in this word obfuscation, which basically in simple terms means taking something that you probably could have understood except that I explained it to you in such a convoluted manner that you couldn't make any sense out of it. Obfuscation is just 
generating noise. And in the short discussion of this paper, um, this was one of the paragraphs said, contrary to popular belief, there's little historical precedent for bad writing. That's a very important statement because there's a tendency for people to think that, oh, scientists have just always been bad at communication. And what he's saying here is, no, they haven't. Scient and he goes on there and says, scientific prose is usually said to begin with Galileo. The Starry Messenger is a classic of vigorous exposition. Even as late as the 19th century, physicians stated their views with strength and conviction. Only in the 20th century has obfuscation become widely acceptable. Now, this is one of the things that upsets me about the science community is that this is not a topic of discussion. There's no concession that communication is worse today than before. And, you know, that's that's an element of shifting baselines. People don't even that's exactly what this is. Now that I think about it, this is a baseline that people should be aware of. A hundred years ago, communication was better. People's brains weren't as clogged up with the mess that we've got today. It's harder than ever before to communicate. So into that scenario comes this little paper that John did in 2008. And hopefully you all are aware of the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, and the fact that they produce these reports every, I think, two to four years, big fat um, reports of what's going on with the climate and like maybe 3,000 or so delegates to these meetings that they have. And along with the report is this shorter little thing called the Summary for Policymakers or SPM. And it's meant to be the plain language explanation of what's in this report. So John did this great experiment where he took 200 or so graduate students in science and math at MIT, had them read the previous year's uh, SPM for that report, and then just simply regurgitate in simple you know, two or three sentences what basically is being said here for the science. When he read over their regurgitations, 84% of them got it wrong. And the bottom line of the whole thing is that, look, if graduate students at MIT can't make sense of this supposed statement for the general public, how in the world do you expect people with no technical background to understand it? I think a very important point. And you might have hoped that that would have been a milestone. The science world would have risen up and said, oh, my God, we got to address this problem. But by 2015, a writer at Nature published another um, similar type thing, took the Fleisch Reading Ease Score Index and applied it to all of the SPMs for the IPCC reports going back to the early 90s and found that the trend was straight downhill, that they, they were getting harder to read with time. And then last week, talking to John in preparation for this discussion today, I asked him, what's it like nowadays? And he said, it's just even worse. You know, it's just a trend that keeps going in that direction. Final little footnote I like to touch back to in 1975, that paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, the author of the paper was Michael Crichton. He went on to write Jurassic Park, a whole series of techno thrillers. Not only that, by 1994, he became the first person ever to have simultaneously number one book, TV show, and movie, um, and just dominated Hollywood. He was a huge resource that the science world could have taken advantage of, but once he got outside the ivory tower, once he went to Hollywood, nobody would listen to him. And he spent 25 years spinning his wheels, trying to reach back to the science world, this is what happens to the ivory tower. Once you get outside of it, you get redefined. Why am I so clear about this? Because I've been through a similar sort of journey. That's what happens. And that's really a shame. And that really kind of leads into what we're going to be doing here. One little exercise, in this discussion. And the second piece here is what John will be talking to us, about the, his involvement with climate policy and this large event that he stages and has been doing for more than a decade. Uh, which is a climate interactive simulation. Specifically, he calls it the World Climate Role Play event. And at the core of it all is this uh, computer model that actually the earlier version was called C Roads. Now it's called N Roads. So I did this simulation, uh, took part in it in 2010. I was at MIT. We were screening my movie Sizzle for Earth Day. And John was on the panel discussion for Sizzle. And then the next morning, he invited me to join in the simulation. And here's how the event went back then, at least. There was about 40 or 50 people all in one big room. Each of these blue dots represents a person. There, you know, there were more than just these. And each person was assigned a country. So actually, I was Indonesia for the simulation. The whole thing took about four or five hours. And the way it worked was that all the countries kind of got together in subgroups of continents or you know, all the neighboring countries. And you had a couple hours to negotiate among yourselves. And the assignment was that your, for your country, you had to figure out what concessions were you going to be willing to make over the next few decades to bring back your carbon, to reduce your carbon emissions. And the problem is that if we don't do anything at all right now, the way the planet's going, or as of 2010, 
we were headed on a trajectory that by the year 2100, the temperature would rise about, I think it was around 5.6 degrees, I recall when he did it then. Um, and that's too much. If, if everything rises that much, the whole planet's going to melt down. So the challenge was to bring it back to, through these reductions in carbon emissions, to reduce the amount of global warming, eventually back to a maximum of 2.0 degrees. So that's what you, the goal of the whole room was, can we make concessions to bring it down to that? So everybody haggled for a couple of, uh, a couple of hours. And then um, John was up in the center in the front of the whole room with his En-ROADS model there, or it was C-ROADS back then, his computer. And so each group then, once you got your concessions together, went up there and reported to him, this is what we're willing to give. Each country had their own specifics and one by one went and fed into the model, all of us. Then eventually when all the inputs were done, he ran the model again and everybody sat there waiting to see if it would come all the way down from 5.6 to 2.0. That was the key moment. And we'll talk about that later, how that went. That was the version that I did in 2010. Now he has scaled it up to even larger version. This is a photo he sent me last week or a few photos of simulation they were doing at, uh, they did with MIT with uh, undergraduates there. And he's added on other elements. So in addition to doing the world climate simulation, they act out scenes now. And he'll tell you about that with the different characters who they represent and just kind of added this theatrical element to it. So it's an amazing event. He has done it not just at universities, but with lots of members of Congress, with the UN multiple times and at the COP meetings for climate. So really, I think probably the, the most important simulation of this sort of live event going on around the world. And one last thing to add in here is um, the other character that we're gonna have in our event, which is our official fool, which is Dr. Patty Limerick. I have to give you a little bit of background on her and how she works with our course for you to understand why we're adding her to this event. Uh, bring on the fool. And so not yet, Patty, but a little bit of setup on this. Um, I thought about doing this as an ambush, almost like dirty trick on John to give him no forewarning, but then I thought it through and figured, you know, you better have a little bit of warm up of what we're doing here. So for those of you who have taken the uh, ABT framework course or read the narrative gym book, um, this is the one of the core simple little diagrams that we use, which is everybody's always saying, know your audience. This is the simplest divide on your, your audience, which is the inner versus outer circle. And this is an important divide because this splits along narrative structure. Your inner circle doesn't need narrative structure. You can give them information. They've got the context. They know the consequences. They know why this is important. They're the most fun and easy to communicate with because they don't need any of that stuff. But everybody else is the outer circle. And the problem that people make is th uh, thinking that that blue inner circle is larger than it really is. So everybody else is the outer circle and they need this narrative structure, the ABT structure, setting things up, staying the problem and addressing it. But then there's another element that we've come across in the last six months, and that's the idea of one more character in this process, which is what we've, we've identified as the official fool. And this is someone who basically knows narrative structure. They have enough common sense to know how to communicate. They know how to ask questions, but they're so far outside the outer circle. They're so distanced from that inner circle that they just simply don't care what anybody thinks about them. And as a result, and they, they have no knowledge of the content. They don't know what the topic is. And as a result, these simple, obvious questions occur to them. And because they're outside the dynamic, they're willing to just ask the questions that nobody else is willing to ask. And it turns out that person can be very, very important. This is what goes on in our working circles exercise within the training. Over and over again, they report back. We had somebody in our working circle, we had four scientists, and then this guy from the business world showed up and asked the best questions, forced us to get this stuff clear because that person didn't have the background, the content in common with all of us. So this is what we mean by the fool. And Dr. Patricia Limerick is one of the top historians of the American West in our country. She is a MacArthur Fellow Professor at the University of Colorado. She's also an official fool. So back when she was doing her PhD at Yale University, she began to delve into studying the role of the fool in societies. Uh, she eventually got herself designated the official fool at Yale and then at Harvard when she was a professor there and eventually at University of Colorado where she went and co-founded the Center for the American West there. And it's in our course in the past year that she has brought this concept of fool in and we found this actual structural definition for why this is actually an important role to have in a character and things that can come out of it. And as a result, we have invited her to join the conversation today. So on that note, um, <laughs> Dr. 
Patricia the Fool Limerick and John Sturman, can you join us? I shall stop sharing. And good afternoon, John. Great. Well, thanks so much, Randy and uh, Patricia. Thanks for being here. I'm delighted. Um, and just as you said, we don't need to call you doctor. You can call Absolutely her Patty. Absolutely not. Call okay, me John. You, you can call her Patty. Um, and yeah, how about a um, little bit of background where you are right now with the, the simulation? And I'd say just get started. But the one challenge you're going to have is that Patty's going to kind of lead a lot of the discussion from this point because we need you to explain to her what exactly is this simulation house where she's putting, she's going into official mode with the fool hat. So fool take hat. it away, John, explain to Patty sure. what the whole thing is. Okay, great. So uh, let's do it ABT style, right? So we know that climate change threatens our prosperity, our health, our security, and our lives, and that people need to know what the science says we can do about it. But as you quoted me earlier, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. Therefore, we created what I'm gonna show you now, which is the En-ROADS Climate Policy Simulator, which is a way that everyone can learn for themselves about how the climate and economy works and what we can do to stave off the catastrophe that's looming. So how was that for ABT? I mean, I don't know, can a fool be that approving? That's I'm Oh, yes, of course, a fool can be extremely enthusiastic, but that should make you nervous. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, you know, sucker me in and then you're going to hit me, hit me hard. So, uh, yeah, so what we've done is, and I'm serious, you know, there's abundant research. I mean, I'm, in, I'm an academic. I want everything I do to be grounded in evidence. Stories are great, but the stories have to be based on something real. Otherwise, they can hurt people. So uh, there's abundant evidence from risk communication from, uh, from the communication sciences in general that you just can't tell people and expect that anything's gonna change. And of course, this is known, the idea that you can fill in the gaps in people's knowledge is known as the deficit theory. And uh, it's incredibly popular still today throughout the sciences and I think in economics and social science too, even though it's been repeatedly, repeatedly shown to be just dead wrong. Uh, you know, so the, the model that a lot of my dear colleagues um, follow is, well, we're gonna do the fundamental basic research about how the climate works and what we can do. And then we're gonna publish it in the peer reviewed journals and everybody's gonna read it. And then, you know, members of Congress and so forth are gonna come and ask us to testify and CEOs are gonna come and ask for briefings. And then we're gonna, you know, show them a million PowerPoint slides and then we filled in the gaps in their knowledge and now they're gonna do the right thing. And that's just dead wrong. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work at all. Uh, so what does work? Well, listen, if you wanna become uh, a skilled pilot for a new aircraft, you're gonna learn in a simulator. If you wanna become an effective member of an operating room team for surgery, surgery you're gonna do that these days in a, in a medical simulation. And I've been to several of them and they're incredibly realistic. Uh, and it's the same thing for climate change. It's just as complex of a system as the human body. And uh, there's no way to learn about it for yourself other than through experiment and experience. But of course, we can't do experiments on the climate. We only have the one planet. We can't run a controlled experiment. Let's see if we didn't burn fossil fuels, what would have happened to the climate? Oh gosh, look. And, and of course, if we wait for enough experience so that climate change is just so obvious that everybody gets it, then it's just gonna be too late. And we're getting close to that point now. The events of this summer have really woken a lot of people up. But folks still don't have a clear idea of what to do. More and more people understand that this is an existential threat, that it's urgent that we cut emissions, you know, the mantra that comes out of the IPCC, if, if, if people have learned nothing from what the IPCC says in all of those dense, impenetrable reports that, uh, that Randy referred to, it's this. In order to stay under the 2 degrees C, 3.6 Fahrenheit limit that was established in the Paris Agreement, which isn't safe, it's just less harmful than where we're going without action. In order to do that, 
global greenhouse gas emissions have to fall by about half by around 2030, less than a decade from now, and then go all the way to zero by mid-century and probably even become negative, meaning we'd have to pull more CO2 out of the air than we're putting in. Cut emissions in half by 2030, all the way to zero by 2050. More and more people understand that, but very few people have any idea of what would, what would work. What are the high leverage policies? What can matter in time? And which popular ideas couldn't possibly help us or help in time? So what we've done is we've built this interactive simulation model. I know not everybody's able to see this, but uh, I'm gonna share my screen. So uh, it's called En-ROADS, the Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support System. Uh, and what it does is lets you experiment with what is going on in the energy system and what policies you might wanna try. We've designed it. Uh, so first I need to say that this has been developed uh, as a partnership between my group at MIT, uh, the um, Sister Dynamics Group and the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative and a nonpartisan nonprofit called Climate Interactive, as Randy mentioned. Climate Interactive, uh, nonpartisan, nonprofit, think tank, uh, founded and staffed by uh, a number of my former students and good colleagues. And we work closely with them in developing all of this. Uh, and everybody out there can go to climateinteractive.org to learn all about our work. So under the hood here is a fairly large model of how the economy works, the energy system, and the climate. What you're seeing here, I know some people can't see it, is you've got um, on the left-hand graph total global primary energy consumption. So total consumption of energy uh, with coal in brown at the bottom, then oil in red, methane, natural gas in blue, all the renewables in green, bioenergy in pink, and nuclear power on top of that in blue. And you can see the impact of COVID there right around 2020. Uh, and that's projected to grow because of global population growth, economic growth, not as fast as the economy because there is technical progress going on that reduces how much energy we need to run our economy. But it's still in this baseline scenario, generating a huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions, which is on the graph on the right. Most okay, now, can, can I ask a question at this point? Of course. Um, Patty, are you clear on everything? Oh dear, oh goodness gracious. Um, um, hmm. uh, yes, I am clear on one thing, which is different from saying everything, but I, am, I can totally uh, understand and follow those bands of color. Yep. They're bright and they're rainbow, which happens to match my own clothing. This is yep. very exciting. I ended up coming yep. dressed for that. So Exactly um, right. And from the dirty coal in brown to the right. green and renewable I energy I up there. there. The bioenergy thing is very tiny and uh, renewable yeah. are getting thicker. But so I can do that. And I'm saying what everybody else can see. So it must be very obvious because I'm able to see it. So but right. uh, then the rest of the slide breaks my heart. Uh, because I think, oh, look, the fool's doing really well. I can totally, global sources of primary energy. If I just look at that, I'm there. I am not as dumb as some people think I am. Look at me, I'm really doing very well. But if I stop looking just at the global sources of primary injury, injury, this is a little bit of a Freudian slip. If I go from that primary energy thing and to the rest of the slide, I, I despair. I, so, and I don't, huh. and I think maybe I didn't need to see all the little gray, I mean, we'll just say that the gray things are, are struggling because the color is so much more interesting. And in some ways, the misery. So this yeah. is really important feedback. And the, the most important thing I want to say is this isn't a slide. This is the live simulation. And all these bars, these sliders at the bottom are the things you can try to save our climate. And so. Okay, all right. Good, good. Okay. So, yeah. Can you, at that point, make it clear to the fool here, who apparently thought that was a slide, um, mm -hmm. Can you show the foolishness of her perception um, in detail? Oh. So what we do when we sit down with anyone, whether it's a senator, member of Congress, CEO, or middle school student, and all of these audiences have used the model. Uh, 
interrupt, but I have to ask the percentages because we do have things about percentages going on here. When you say uh, we sit down with senators and policymakers and so on, uh, could you just tell me just a, a rough estimate because I don't know how you would really quantify it, but what is the percentage of fools in the populations that you're speaking of, the senators, the uh, corporate, the people? So I'm not gonna mention any names or political affiliations. We've done this with people from both political parties and leaders from across the spectrum around the world. Um, I, I don't know how to judge what fraction of them are, are fools. And of course, what fraction are everyday fools as you've defined it and what fraction are official fools. Pretty clearly there aren't as many official fools anywhere as we need. And there's far too many everyday fools. Well, I, I don't know, Mike. You know, can, can I interject a little aside here and sorry to, to bog things down, but uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I came across somebody talking about someone who received the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory journalism, I think. And to that very point, my question was, who, who are the judges for something like that? Are they the fools that need to have things explained to them? Or are they a bunch of highly educated people that listen to something? Oh, wow, that was a good explanation. How do yeah. you know? Why aren't the judges a bunch of truck drivers in Omaha? as opposed to academics judging themselves as being great explainers. Sorry, that's my little editorial side. So let's get back to the, the but as you asked- uh, It's right, a great point. Here. And you know, the purpose of this simulation is to help everybody. We're gonna need everybody, right? It, you know, experts and policymakers cannot make the changes we need to bring emissions down. We've got, you see emissions <laughs> over here and they've got to fall by half by 2030 and then go to zero by mid-century or so in order to limit the warming to two degrees C or 3.6 Fahrenheit. There's no way to do that unless the public gets involved because okay, so let, let me, people have to vote and they're not gonna vote against their interest yeah, yeah. in being reelected. Okay, let me let me jump back in here and sorry, we're, <clears throat> we're butchering your whole presentation, but that's what we do here in this podcast. Um, and let's see, Matt, are you able to hear my audio good enough? Because my, my internet went out for some reason, so I'm on my cell phone right now, but Matt, am I working it okay? It comes through good enough, Randy. Okay, good enough. Um, <clears throat> so, so just, I wanna interject one little side note, which is um, on the subject of, of COVID communications. And uh, last October, almost a year ago, uh, a scientist epidemiologist named Dr. Michael Osterholm was on Meet the Press and he talked about the fact that we're not communicating well and he said we're failing to communicate in a singular voice, we're failing to take advantage of story and storytelling and as a result I reached out to him. It's been a year now, he's still the only prominent figure from the science world who's saying that we're not communicating well and that's what drew me to him, that's what drew me to you and so anything I'm pushing back on you, you know, about communications, I, you have a world of respect for me because you're one of the few people that pointed that out, you know, look, it's, it, you did an emperor has no clothes thing with that 2008 um, article in science, in my opinion. So I think that's a little bit of what we're pushing on right now in terms of, you know, you say we need to reach the, the public. How much, how many experiences do you have with this model of people who are not truck drivers, but really zero technical background coming up to you and, and Quite saying a this lot. is eye-opening? Yeah. Quite a lot. And, and, and of course it isn't just me, it's everybody on our team. And the now more than 300, what we call En-ROADS climate ambassadors who yeah. experienced the model, um, got motivated to go through the training that we provide, which is all free, and then take it out into their communities all over the world. I mean, we're talking about people going to African villages, boardrooms for Fortune 500 companies at every level. And we, we literally run this with middle school students and not just in the elite schools, uh, you know, in the Boston suburbs, but in West Virginia, in in the South, all over. And okay. And, and so as a means of introducing the overall exercise, um, let me tell my one experience there in 2010, and then you you take it from there and modify how it's, it's grown since then. But, but what happened to me in 2010, I joined your thing with 40 or 50 people that day. Everyone in the room was assigned a country. I got assigned Indonesia. Incredibly, John still remembers that I was in Indonesia. Then you got put with a bunch of other countries in that region. And you were given this assignment to make concessions to reduce carbon emissions so that we can keep the planet from warming up to this horrible level, which was what did we think it was five point something you had back then was if, yeah. if we do nothing different by 2100, we're going to be way up there at five point. Oh, we've got to pull things back in carbon emissions so that we don't go past two two degrees increase. So everybody went and agonized for a couple hours about what you were willing to give on concessions 
Then we went up and reported to you all of our, here's our three little numbers of our concessions. You plugged it in the model. And the reason this is so powerful for me comes straight out of our storytelling stuff, which is what this ABT Time podcast is about. Because stories, the power of stories rests in specificity and specifically in a singular moment. Great movies all come down to that one moment where it all comes together. And that's what you did with that, that simulation that day was that everybody finally quieted down and then we sat there and watched as you ran the model and we waited for that one number to come back and everybody hoped that we had brought it from 5.6 or whatever it was all the way down to two with our concessions. And when you ran it, the thing spit out, it went from 5.6 to like 5.2 and that was it. And everybody was like, oh my God, Are you kidding? Yeah. With all the concessions we made, that's all the impact that we've done. And then you turned to the crowd and you said, everybody get back to work. You got to dig much deeper if you're going to have an impact right. on this curve. We're and then we did it later that. and it improved a little bit. So that was that pretty much reflective of the simple exercise back then? Yeah. So uh, that's what we call the world climate role play. And um, people take the roles of different world leaders and they negotiate just like people do at the COPS, the Conference of the Parties, the big global climate summits, the next one coming up in November in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, and we've been at all of them since Copenhagen in 2009. And I was at that one and in Paris and the year after and the year after that. Um, and our team has been there at all of them using the model in various ways with all kinds of audiences. But, you know, Randy, instead of telling people about it, let's yeah. do it. So, you know, when we sit down with a CEO or a senator or, um, you know, a class of high school students, what we do is we say, listen, you've got to cut emissions dramatically here what do you think we ought to do? I never sit down with a senator and say, so this is what we need to do about climate change. And, you know, <laughs> my, dean, my dean loves to tell the following joke. He's, you know, every time I go into his office, he says, you know, every time a faculty member comes into my office, what they start out is they say, good afternoon, dean, let me tell you how you can help me today. And that's what the life of a congressperson or senator is like. People are asking them for something, lobbying for this or that. We never do that. We sit down, we say, what do you want to try to see if we can solve this problem? It's totally up to you. And people give whatever answer they want. So what do you want to try? What is the one thing we could do that you think would have the biggest impact on saving that? our climate? And that's, to, I, will, I would move my little, if I had access to it, but I would move my little uh, thing there on the, on the spectrum and I would take... I would take maybe because there might be fewer fights over that, I might take energy efficiency and buildings and industry. And I would be choosing that not because I thought it had the greatest impact, but because I thought I would uh, right. play on lead buildings. People are already doing well, that. So now let's try it and see what happens. So I'm going to pull the lever. And as I pull the lever, it's not static and inert anymore. Look what's happening, right? More energy efficiency lowers the warming because we're lowering how much fossil we're lowering how much energy we use overall and that lowers the fossil. So as I move that lever towards more aggressive deployment of energy efficiency, everything gets a whole lot better. So I'll pull it about halfway. And what that means in the real world is we are going to need to provide um, uh, subsidies for people to invest in energy efficiency in their homes and for businesses to do the same. Uh, commercial buildings and industrial facilities. We're going to need access to low cost capital and uh, subsidies, especially for the poor and the disadvantaged, because they can't afford to do it now, even though they live in the worst, least efficient housing now. And it matters big time. It's a huge impact. You've dramatically lowered the warming. We went down um, from six and a half Fahrenheit to 5.9. That's a big deal. Um, and so, in that fashion, you know, this is how the model works. You, you get immediate feedback on the likely effect of your action. So it helped a lot, but we have a long way to go. What else do you want to try? Well, what I want to uh, acknowledge is that I did nothing on the proportions of um, sources of free energy. You I still had, have could I? <laughs> a lot of coal, oil, gas, and, and some renewables. So there might be a moment where I would think, well, oh, that's nice that I got a little bit less gray, but I certainly had no impact on these 
what's the more important determinant of what goes into the oh, air. How do you want to shift the energy system so it's more renewable and less coal, oil, and gas? Now I'm going to speak for individual human beings worldwide, if I might, which is a very ambitious goal, but I'm going to do that. Uh, I actually think of my own energy efficiency, and I think that's not even, that is such a microscopic thing here. So the one domain where I might have some impact is, <laughs> is so piteously micro that it's hard to know why I would bother. And I wonder if there isn't, and I know that this will happen to people when they think, well, I could change my behavior, but that's not gonna mean a darn thing. So, uh, so I want to know how we are going to deal with a possible demoralization. Oops. So yeah. Oh, so so you're you're raising a fantastic point here. When we when you when you said you know increase energy efficiency, part of that might be personal behavior, right? You you might decide, hey, I'm gonna spend the money to insulate my house and put in better windows and plug up all the leaks. And people should do that. But that's not the only thing it represents. It represents policies that in the US our government is debating right now as they mark up the reconciliation bill. How much of a subsidy and tax credit should we provide for individuals and businesses with what kind of income thresholds so that you'd have an economic incentive to do this? So we give you a bigger tax credit, lots of people are gonna do it. We, we provide low cost capital uh, for the poor so that they can you know, finance this at, without paying uh, usurious interest rates. That's a policy. That's not counting on the um, goodwill of people to change their personal behavior when all the pressures are telling them, hey, be wasteful because energy is too cheap. So, okay, so that's I, a re really important point here. So and I, I just want to say, though, that I'm trying to be attentive to the, I think what this, uh, I'll call it a game, though I understand it's assimilation, but game I, is fine. I need yeah. a little bit of a uh, panic button option. I should have a panic button where I get to say, uh-oh, unintended, dispirited fatalism, sudden onset, help me. Because when I think about all of what, okay, when I think about how how really not even worth discussing is, is my neighborhood's response to this energy efficiency, right. my little house. So I think there is a scale opportunity for despair here. So- and but that's so this is so important because despair is where most people are starting right now, especially after this terrible summer, hottest on record, horrible extreme weather, wildfires all over the world, Siberia is burning. It rained on the highest point of Greenland for the first time in the record this past summer. Uh, and the melt in one day, I believe, was enough to cover all of Florida two inches deep. So people are already starting in despair. I can't tell you how many serious business executives and political leaders privately, once, and a lot in public, start out telling me, you know, it's too late. We're screwed. We ought to just focus on adaptation. Things are going to get worse. And young people do, too. Uh, they feel that their future's been stolen. And what happens when people do this is they actually come out the other side, many, maybe I think most based on our research, with more hope. But you've got to put a little more skin in the game here, though, uh, Madam Fool. So what else do you want to try? I got the despair over my own tiny um, inability to do anything that would that would scale up. Then, then you got me to the second round of despair because then you said that these policies were being debated and that actually, then I began, then I went further into despair because I thought, oh exactly. yeah, right. As if that Congress is gonna do it, huh? That's really, um, and as if I'm gonna persuade that Congress. So I think you should consider, you and Climate Interactive, a little uh, panic button, really a little, uh-oh, I know you were trying to save me from despair, but uh-oh, I'm going deeper. Help me, uh, th lifeline, throw out well, a lifeline. The thing is, I can't push the panic button and then have all the levers move on their own to something because then you wouldn't be choosing, you wouldn't be learning. So no, to, uh, to help me, <laughs> to, to say, stay in there, you silly thing. Do you think it's going to get better if you just go nope. further? In well, and Patty, we need you to make some choices here. What would you like to move for these sliders? Uh, my choices. Uh, well, okay. So it does look like uh, there's a 
pretty sizable thing going on with the diminishing of uh, coal and coal mining and the shutting of coal plants. So I guess I would right. take the coal. Um, Great. So let's get the coal out of the system. And there's a couple <laughs> ways to do that. One would be policies and actions that would stop the construction of all new coal power plants and, and other infrastructure. And you choose the year, 2025 doesn't seem implausible here. And look at that graph there, coal peaks and falls. And, and now that got us down to three degrees C. That's a big deal. Getting the coal out of the system really helps. Wait, 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 wait. Hang, on, hang on, John. Where, where, can you show us where are you seeing the three degree C? Right over here on the right in big blue letters, three degrees C. And remember where we started is three. Wait, point on the, hang on, hang on the right. Uh, I'm not seeing that on my graph. My uh, I'm seeing it, Randy. Everyone else is. Oh, yeah. shucks. <laughs> Am I not getting the whole width of the screen? No, whatever Apparently, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I guess I would so, and, and let's take a look. Okay. There's the temperature graph. This is where we were headed before. And the blue line is what you've been able to do. And that's a big improvement. Now, not enough and not in time, but getting the coal, you got to keep the fossil carbon in the ground and coal being the worst of the fossil fuels, you got to keep the coal in the ground. It's cheap and abundant, but we can't burn any more of it. And, and you've done a great job uh, of doing that. And we could even get it out even faster. We could pay uh, coal plants to shut down, accelerate uh, early retirement. You could regulate them. There's a lot of ways to do this. And now coal is, is really on the way out. And that's helping a lot. We could do more, um, but it doesn't go away immediately because a lot of countries in the world are heavily dependent on it. And it's a powerful lobby in those nations, but that helped a, a lot. So well, can I just tell you that that helped a lot as well, because I think I think I got off on the wrong foot with energy efficiency, because that is so much about uh, cumulative individual choice and members of Congress and so on. And I think by empowering me just to quit the new construction, which I as a power I do not have, but I didn't particularly worry about not having that power because she just let me do it. So I can see that that is your anti despair Oh. That's part of it, for sure. And let me tell you, I don't think it's just about personal action. On the other hand, uh, I'm coming to you now from my home, and uh, it's about a 95-year-old uh, typical New England colonial revival stick-built, you know, wooden house. And when we moved in here, when my family and I moved here in 1991, it was horribly inefficient. We did a bunch of stuff over the years to improve it, but six and a half years ago, we did what's called a deep energy retrofit. The whole place was falling down. So we had to do a renovation. And instead of just doing a renovation, we did the deep energy retrofit. And what that means is we spent a little more money and a little more time to make it super efficient. So there's a lot of insulation in the walls, including we put some on the outside of the walls. We have really high performance windows here. We tightened the uh, building envelopes so it doesn't leak all the time. You know, you, you pay to heat all this air in the winter and then it just leaks out. Uh, we put um, high efficiency appliances everywhere. The most important things we did were we completely eliminated the natural gas, which was the heating and hot water, and replaced that with heat pumps, air source heat pumps. The house is now 100% run by electricity and we put solar on the roof. And so now we've got six full years of experience with this. And what I can tell you is we have made over that time period about half, 50% more energy than we use. So my carbon footprint in my home is now negative. We are a power plant and we get paid for all the excess energy we put into the electric grid because Massachusetts and all the, um, New England and mid-Atlantic states have climate policies. So it isn't just dependent on Washington. They have climate policies and that makes it very attractive to do what I did here. And there's ancillary benefits. The house is more comfortable. It's bigger inside without an addition because we got rid of all that natural gas and the pipes and the radiators. The heat pumps don't take up hardly any room. They're outside, there's no ducts, et cetera. Um, it's, uh, it's healthier for us. It's just better and it's cost-effective. We, we've been making money on this. 
and and there's a huge opportunity to do this. So don't don't belittle energy efficiency here. It's actually the fastest, safest, cheapest thing we can do to help with the climate crisis. It's still not a silver bullet. It doesn't solve the whole problem. Getting rid of the coal helped a lot. Still got one whole degree to go. What else do you want to try here? I'm very curious to know what will happen with this. Um, I won't say that this is the cause that I would care to put my own name. Well, I would do it. I guess I would do it. Okay. I would like to really go all the way with nuclear. Okay. So let's try it. So nuclear is the blue band at the top and it matches the historical behavior. Uh, let's really crank up nuclear. And you can see the blue band got a lot bigger. In fact, if you look at that graph, it shows nuclear capacity just explodes starting basically in the next couple of years and, uh, and grows by what a factor of five by about 2050. That's huge. Right. I will have to move away from Boulder, Colorado, though, because well, so I'm I'm staying agnostic here, right? It's your choice. Yes. But I, I, what did it do for the climate? We were at three degrees, but and you're now you're at two point nine. So there's been this massive expansion at great cost in nuclear capacity, and all the safety and waste disposal and proliferation risk and terrorist risk and all the issues that come with nuclear, whether you think they're real or not, it's controversial still. And it only bought you a tenth of a degree. It doesn't do that much. And then the question is why? And so to get a handle on that, look at the graph here. You've got a lot more nuclear. I'm gonna roll it back. Look at the green band. That's your wind and solar and hydro and geothermal. Those are your renewables, right? They produce no greenhouse gases uh, after deployment. So what happens to the green band when we go all in on nuclear? Uh oh, I didn't want that. So uh, John, because- It got, it got I, a lot smaller. I'm gonna finish the sentence because I am gonna have to be, I will be driven out of Boulder, Colorado if I am known to be the person who said go all the way with nuclear. And since it turned out to be an, not a very productive idea, I would like to reverse that before my neighbors come force okay. me out. Yeah, and I mean, I get you. I've spent a little time in Boulder and I, I very quickly learned I am definitely not cool enough to live there. Right, so I so need to get whatever I had in the way of reputation has to come back really fast. So I'm reversing on the nuclear and I guess uh, I'm gonna do much better. Although people are not thinking through the, uh, rare earth minerals and so on, but I'm gonna go up on renewables. I would like to go up on okay. So um, huge expansion in the renewables and another 10th of a degree. Um, so that's helpful and it'll be a lot, you know, you'll, you'll be invited to a lot more um, parties in Boulder now. Um, start notice they're gonna get, I'll get people with uh, concerned about landscape disruption. I'll get people who were concerned yep rare earth mining. I'm not going to, maybe they won't drive me out as much as they would have for the nuclear, but I'm going to be at risk here because um, sure. I'll put some burdens. At by the way, that's one of the great things about energy efficiency. You don't have to build a power plant anywhere, whether it's a nuclear plant or a solar farm. Um, let, let me, um, let me jump in here, Matt, you want to read um, one or two of those questions there um, about the categories? Oh, sure. Yeah, we got a question from uh, Mr. DYT436 on YouTube. Uh, the categories are a bit abstract. Uh, could some reflect actions uh, individuals can take, such as ride your bike to work instead of the car? Uh, instead Absolutely. Of transport? That's a great, great question. So we didn't touch energy efficiency in transportation yet. Uh, so that includes things like, well, what if we had more efficient automobiles? through stronger cafe standards. But it also includes people getting rid of their car and riding their bike. I've been a bicycle commuter my whole career and uh, rain or shine, winter, summer, doesn't matter, hurricanes, snow, doesn't matter. Uh, and so that is included there. And it's not just ride a bike, it's also communities deciding, let's put sidewalks and bike lanes in so it's safe for kids and everybody else to walk and ride to school or, or work or, or the supermarket instead of having to drive, uh, et cetera. And that helps that a little tiny bit of energy efficiency and transportation got you another 10th of a degree and more gets you more. So, 
So that's, that's really helpful. But I think there's a really important point here. People, so you, Patty, and also our, our question, uh, questioner out there are focusing on what we can do personally. And it's incredibly important. And I've done that here in my house and, you know, I bicycle and I compost and so on. There's a lot of things that I try to do personally. So I think it's important. You got to walk your talk here, but it's not going to be enough. If you want to take personal action, then one of the things you need to do, and this is a yes and not an either or, is you also got to get politically active. You've got to start lobbying your companies, your institutions, and your government officials to enact the policies that can get us where we need to go. So That's I, personal action as well. I think I've been incentivized and I may be making choices that are not what I would actually, well, okay. So let us, I, I did really well when I dropped coal. Uh, so I guess I would like to cut back on oil, but I'm also very curious I'm going to actually, my first thing I want to ask is to drop, is cut population, because I don't myself think that's going to make much difference, but I would like to know if it will. So here we're, we're using the UN's um, main projection for population. You see the regions here, the US, the EU, uh, India, China, the other developing nations, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we can lower that and you see it's falling. Um, the question is, well, there's two questions. One is, does it do any good for the climate problem? And let's look at total population here. So if I, there's your base case. UN says not quite 11 billion people by 2100. If we cut that back, it doesn't really start to have a big impact until that latter part of the century. And that's just because of the inertia in the age structure of the population around the world. But it also doesn't do much for the climate. And, and then the second question is, how would you do it? And there are answers to that. And those, those answers are empowering women and girls around the world, uh, education, especially for young girls, but for everybody, it's access to healthcare, not just pre and post natal care, but general health care. So people are healthier and life expectancy is increased. And those are the things that are proven to work to reduce family size, reduce the onset of the childbearing years for women. And, uh, and we know how to do that. And those are wonderful, important things to do. They are one of the um, categories of the sustainable development goals that the UN has been promoting. Uh, but it so doesn't let me ask a question here. I mean, the, climate problem. So the, the question is, what's the magic bullet? What's the one simple thing that er, we can do right now that's just going to fix this overnight? I, so, just, as I was incentivized not for me to say, Randy, you all have to figure it out yourself. You're really trying to trick me into becoming the expert instead of the guide on the side. Right. Instead of trying to drop oil. Because I did that was I got so incentivized by having my only really significant success when I when I uh, cut back on. Okay, so go for it, fool. Give, give him some more things to, to experiment uh, with. Great. So the, the, the most effective way to cut oil and all the other fossils is to put a price on carbon pollution. And, uh, and so we can do that right here. So I'll add a carbon price. Now we're at 2.8 and uh, you know a moderate carbon price, which is, I'll round it off to $60 a ton, which is 53 cents a gallon on gasoline, which would leave gasoline in the United States way below European levels. That gets us all the way down to 2.6. Now, there's a really important uh, issue here. What do you do with the revenue? Well, what you do is you give it back to everybody in the country so that it doesn't hurt the poor, right? So affluent people like us, we should pay more and we can afford to. But low-income people, if you tax gasoline and other fossil fuels, it's going to hurt them. So the way you solve that is to give everybody a carbon dividend. You, you give them a check every quarter, every month, and it's their share of all the revenue that comes from this. And now, because the poor don't use anywhere near as much energy as the rich, those people actually come out better, and the rich pay more like they should. 
And that turns the carbon pricing policy from regressive into progressive. And they're in fact debating this in Washington this week. Now, whether it's gonna happen, nobody can say, but there's some support for that on both sides of the aisle. Okay, let me, let me ask a question to the fool then. Um, Ms. Fool, don't you like trees? Oh, I do. And I also recognize, well, I do hang out with foresters and I, I'm living in a region where a lot of carbon goes in from forest fires from overly dense. Yep. So I don't have a, oh, it's so clear what forest management could do for this because we have now a bunch of uh, overly dense biomass on forest lands. Right. And so I, that confuses me because I do understand that a, a tree, a thriving forest, not a um, troubled sick forest, but would right. actually absorb CO2. I'm not the stupidest of fools here. Look at this, too much time with foresters, actually. <laughs> no, this is great. So let's, let's go over here to the land use sector on the right, and I'm going to reduce deforestation, which is a huge problem, not just in the Amazon and Indonesia, but also in the boreal forest, the Canadian and, and Siberian forests, and that helped a lot. And now let's plant a lot of those healthy trees that you're talking about, okay? And everybody's familiar with this, I think. Uh, it's been popularized in the last couple of years as the trillion tree campaign. And people are out there saying, if we just plant a trillion trees around the world, climate problem solved. It's been touted as a magic bullet. Well, let's, let's do it. We're at 2.5, let's plant a trillion trees. Boom, one, one tenth of a degree. Now, planting trees in many places is a wonderful thing to do. Uh, especially in our cities where especially the poor and communities of color suffer from the urban heat island effect. It's horrible. Uh, so planting trees in those places and in other places around the world is a wonderful thing to do. It restores habitat and improves water availability. It reduces erosion. It preserves biodiversity. It doesn't solve the climate problem. Even though you can see now we have negative land use emissions from about 2047 here on. What, what do those people say to you when you show them this? Do they hate you? Well, uh, I hope they don't hate me, but, uh, <laughs> but they ask, well, you know, why doesn't it have more impact? You've obviously done something wrong. Well, right. it, it doesn't have more, you know, when you plant a tree, so Pakistan just planted, I think a billion trees. And, uh, but how big were those saplings? They're this big. The amount of carbon in there is a few grams. Next year, a few more grams. The year after, a few more grams. It takes decades for those trees to grow large enough to be able to pull a lot of carbon out of the air every year. Um, and that's what's happening here. It, it does eventually become a huge carbon sink, meaning sucks a lot of CO2 out of the air. That's a great thing, but it doesn't kick in until the last few decades of the century. By then it's too late because you're still burning a lot of fossil fuels, especially oil. Um, on, so on, on a similar note, um, whatever happened to 20 years ago, the iron limitation ideas out in the ocean and were those- Same idea, possible? yeah, iron fertilization. Right. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really work. I mean, it, it works in the sense that, so the iron is a limiting nutrient in a lot of the ocean. You put iron or uh, well, rust, uh, iron oxides into the water and you get a phytoplankton bloom. This definitely happens. But see, people are only thinking about the beginning of the process. Then the question is, well, what happens to the carbon in those phytoplankton? And yeah. what happens is most of it goes back into the air because the plankton die or are eaten and the critters that- Okay, let me, let me ask you, let me ask you- It goes back into the air. Yeah, let's take a, a break for a moment here. Let me ask you a few broad, simple, overarching questions detached from this, but your personal experiences with the modeling going out there. Um, You've got this model, which is based on lots of knowledge and is in some ways a truth teller, like you're saying there with the, the trees thing. And you're, you know, you listen to all these people jumping around saying, just plant trees everywhere. And you're looking at your model says, I'm sorry, that's not going to do much. Um, bullet, right. yeah, well, okay. So how often do you have that experience in today's world, looking around all these people running around touting their solution to the climate process? Do you have that experience a lot where you see a, a lot of people yeah. running around with their one thing, and then you're looking at your model saying, no, it's really not going to be that important? all the time. And, you know, in some sense, and I, I hate to presume, so Patty, tell me I'm just totally wet here, but, you know, 
I'm trying to be the fool in a sense who, when somebody says, this is what we need to do, I don't say, no, that's not going to work. I say, let's try it. You know, mm-hmm. uncle, let's try it and see what happens. And then they try it and then they don't like what they see. And then they challenge the assumptions. Well, we can change all the assumptions. So I'm not, we don't have time really to do this, but sure, you can sure. on the trees, you can change all the assumptions about how long does it take trees to reach maturity and how much land does it take uh, for that to happen? And um, well, that, that's why I'm, okay, that's why I'm asking you some of these broad, so, simple questions about the experience. So, but notice the, the, the arc of the conversation. It's not trees are going to solve the problem. No, they won't. Here's my paper that says trees will solve the problem. Well, here's my paper that says they won't. That doesn't work, right? Instead, let's try the trees. Well, it didn't work. How come? Oh, well, you must have been assuming something that I don't agree with. Well, let's put in what you like. Still doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Etc. And pretty soon, most people. So the best thing that can happen when I run a model like this is at the end of the session, somebody says, you know, here's what we need to do to solve the problem. But it's all obvious. I didn't need your model. Right. That's a great outcome because now they've taken it internalized and uh, they're not relying on what could become. Uh, you know, an, an yeah. oracle, a black box that right, the model right. says. Models never say, people say. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, Rod, are you still with us? You want to join in? You got a question or two? Um, I and ask the question that I think is that the question we have to ask now, why should we trust your algorithms, buddy? Huh? I mean, right. we were, we're such a, a suspicion and distrust. So but absolutely right. And you should absolutely not trust it because I'm a professor at MIT. Uh, or because I can tell you what the IPCC says, you should trust it if you're serious about that and not using it as just a rhetorical device to get out of town. The way you trust it is we have published the entire model. It's 100% open box, transparent, fully documented for free. And everything here you can have and you can try yourself. So So everybody listening right now could be playing this game themselves on their own. Absolutely. Go to to n-roads, en-roads.org, and you can start playing with it yourself and change the assumptions and you can see the documentation. You go to the website. You can can see every equation if you want to. Great. Okay. Okay. Rod, Rod, did you have a question? Quick comment and question? Yeah. Quick comment is very interesting to watch this conversation between two geniuses and two fools with a, a fool and a Wait, genius where? mediating. <laughs> um, very interesting to watch the um, comms perspective, someone coming very much from the big picture and someone diving in immediately and saying, but how does that affect me from the small picture? Yeah. And I think that's something that's critical to somehow bridge here because I can imagine exactly that. People who are into models and simulations, which I am, are sitting there going, this is fantastic. People who find this intimidating and strange um, and un- unapproachable won't. But that that leads to my question is, if you haven't already done this, you probably thought of it, you're at MIT. Um, can you turn this into an actual game with this yeah. back end behind it? But actually, I'm, I'm a, an addict for SimCity and games like this. And yeah. I'm always fascinated. But what you get then is interesting, interactive, immersive visual feedback. You see pictures of planets, you see buildings growing and shrinking. This to me would be the back end of one of the most amazing and fascinating games in the world. Yeah. Could that go there? Have you thought about that? Is it too expensive? Am I insane? So it's a great, great um, idea. And we have thought about it. And lots of people suggest it. Um, it. It's very expensive to compete with, you know, Call of Duty 5 or whatever it is. Or, right, right. Uh, you know, exactly. they spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to produce those things. If anybody wants to help with this, I'd be delighted to talk to, to them. Uh, you know, but well, this, okay, okay, let me interject one thing on that. This is the same old thing I talked about in my movie Flock of Dodos 15 years ago, which is you're constrained by the truth that handicaps you against all those competitors, you know, Call of Duty or whatever, Sim City or who knows what. They don't have to be dealing with the truth. You are handicapped by the truth, which means you've got to have this extra effort in your whole project to keep things within the bounds of reality as opposed to telling a good story. 
So we have to do both, right? And I mean, yeah, you know, exactly. Rod, your, your comment is so, so on point here, right? Lots of people have been building computer simulation models since computers. Um, and most of them have done precisely nothing. They've had no real world impact. On the other hand, people have been building games uh, and they're incredibly sophisticated now. And some of them are a heck of a lot of fun, but you know, as, as wonderful as SimCity is, um, you know, I really don't want to design a better LA based on SimCity. Uh, and so you have to have two things. You have to have, well, so there's two failure modes, right? If you've got the world's best model, but a lousy user experience, you've wasted everybody's time and nothing will happen. But the other failure mode is you have the world's most exciting, immersive interface, but the model doesn't have integrity. Now, that's really dangerous because you've created an environment where people can learn harmful wrong lessons far more effectively than ever before. So you have to have both. And I mean, I, I would love to make it a game. So what the way we do it is the game part is what happens in the interpersonal negotiation that Randy described. So I'll give you an example. Um, with, with, uh, we do this with executives all the time. And so some of them are gonna represent the rich countries and the big industries and the, you know, the oil companies and others are gonna represent the poor countries and the environmental groups who don't have any money. And when we can do this live, and I did it live at MIT uh, in August, with our executive MBAs. And these are serious people. They're mid-career, high, high potential future leaders. Very serious. They're pet paying a lot of money to be in our program and they don't wanna waste their time. So we assign them to these delegations. And the first thing I do is, okay, you people, you're the environmental groups, you're Greta Thunberg, and you folks, you're the Sub-Saharan Africa countries and the other poor countries around the world. And I say poor because, you know, let's not mince any words here, right? We're not just gonna call them emerging or less developed. There are, there are poor countries with billions of people who don't have reliable water or electricity or healthcare or transportation or anything. And I say, okay, now come sit on the floor. And they have to sit on the floor and they actually get into it. And meanwhile, the rich countries and the rich industries, their tables are laden high with beautiful snacks. The poor people have nothing. And all of a sudden there's a real grievance in the room between those who are deprived and those who have a lot. And that motivates a serious negotiation. And when they get started, and Randy, I think this was your experience, you know, you hear people standing up and saying, you Western countries, you created the climate crisis, you need to cut your emissions, we need to burn fossil fuel in order to grow our economy. And of course, what you can't do that. Everybody has to cut. But you can't tell them that they have to learn it for themselves. So um, That's very cool. I, I did this. So very quick story. I did this once with a group of uh, uh, government provincial leaders and business leaders from China. It was at MIT. It was with simultaneous interpretation. And we got to the point in the simulation where that had happened. So everybody is from China, but they're all playing these different roles. And so their proposals were you know, the US has to cut and Europe has to cut and Australia and Canada and New Zealand and so on, Russia, they have to cut, we get to burn to grow our economy. And when you do that in the simulation, you can show them that sea level rise is still so bad and extreme weather is still so bad, et cetera, that Shanghai is gonna disappear. Shenzhen is gonna disappear. And I showed them that. And then I said, so what does that mean? And um, there was dead silence for a long time, like 10 seconds. That's a long time. And I said, I said, so what does it mean? And there was more silence. And finally, somebody said something. And what I heard in my earpiece was, it means we have to leave the past in the past. That was the critical moment. They had discovered for themselves that this fight over historical responsibility doesn't matter everybody's got to cut, including the developing countries, including China, or else they themselves are gonna suffer greatly. And all of a sudden it broke open. Now it wasn't a negotiation about um, if, 
if you win, I must be losing. It wasn't zero sum anymore. Now they realized they had to view it from what negotiation people call the integrative frame, meaning we have to create shared value together. We're all in the same boat together. If I had told them that, nothing would have happened. They all would have folded their arms and said politely, BS. But they discovered it for themselves. And it's that, that live human real negotiation experience with real grievances. Why am I sitting on the effing floor when they have chairs and delicious food? I'm gonna go steal their chairs, which happens. Uh, that's where the gaming comes in. So um, I have two or three things I would like to say. One of them is that the Oracle at Delphi in Greek tales seems to be so much of uh, inspiration for you because that's what you're doing. People are going to the Oracle and the Oracle at Delphi, the priestesses apparently made very little, uh, they did not just tell you what to do. They spoke in sometimes quite unintelligible ways or ways that were difficult to interpret and so on. And I just think you might really enjoy feeling common spirit over 2,500 years with the Oracles at uh, the priestesses and the oracles at Delphi, because it is really kind of that same thing of, can you tell us the future? And um, and it's usually said, uh, like in aphorisms, like the thing that you just said, right. it means leave the, so I just I just feel that you and the oracle of Delphi need to be in touch with each other, just because you were, uh, you could learn from oh. each other for the oracle. Then I also just think there are ways <clears throat> in which this could be, uh, like a human, I think the more that we can be embodied, and maybe it's because we have been in pandemic isolation for so long in a digital world, that to think of ways, and that's where you're, what you're talking about with the physical, now some people are on the floor, some people are having the snacks and so on, but I just am thinking of human chess boards, uh, yeah. there's just ways in which... Uh, yeah, so I, I love these ideas. I, I, I think the John, John, are you able to see the, the photos I'm sharing? Uh, I'm not Matt, how yeah. do I? Yeah. So, uh, jo uh, John, stop uh, sharing your screen for a moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Stop sharing. Then let you tell us about these. Uh, we got three of your photos you sent to me. So, there's the first one. You see it? All right. Um, what? That is not. This hold on. Is okay. I've stopped sharing. You can go ahead and show this. So, yeah, this is uh, this picture is about 200 MIT sophomores just two weeks ago. Um, uh, uh, doing the role play negotiation with me. Um, as part of their welcome back to campus. And so they're at these round tables representing the different delegations. And this is just the beginning, but then I don't know if Randy's got the pictures of everybody standing up and do we, yelling. Do we see this next picture? Uh, do you see the person choking? Oh yeah, the die-in? No, I don't see that, right. Shucks, what, what's going on here, uh, Matt? What do I need to do? Um, you might need to stop the... sharing and reshare. Yeah, because we're, okay. we seem to be stuck on the first picture. Okay, let's see what happens if I do this and boom, reshare. Um, and yeah. there we go. Share it again. And yeah, so what's happening here is the, the young woman on the left is uh, playing the role of Rex Tillerson, the former Secretary of State and former CEO of ExxonMobil. And she has just been trying to give her speech to everybody about why they oppose a price on carbon, which is one of the policies that you liked here, Patty. And then what's happening, these two other people are staging, they're from the environmental group, they're Greta Thunberg and her group, and they came in and they staged a die-in right in front of Rex. And it was fantastic. This is the kind of stuff that happens. I mean, it, it was amazing. It was really wonderful. And I mean, I've seen senior business executives wearing their suit and tie give these incredible speeches about the need for social justice and then staging a walkout with their delegation until everybody you know, uh, compromises in their direction. It's, it's really fun. It, it, you, know, you mentioned improv, Patty, that's what it is. Right now. Yeah. People, you know, and it's not just learning about climate and learning about science, although they do, they're also getting practice in enacting their improv skills, their public speaking skills, their negotiation. Okay, John, John, on that note, can you tell us one, two or three, your favorite moments over the last 15 years of doing these simulations, one or two times that you really remember that, that people were just blown away? Uh, well, this kind of thing that you're seeing in the picture happens a lot, you know, these demonstrations, walkouts. Uh, one other thing I remember very well, we had a 
bitter, difficult negotiation between, um, this was a few years ago, uh, President Trump, which was uh, one of our executive MBAs, and, uh, and Xi Jinping. And um, both, both, were, both those roles were played by women that day. And um, uh, they finally saw that they had to do something together or everybody was gonna lose. And they demanded a written contract. So I grabbed a piece of paper, I, I wrote out a contract uh, capturing their agreement and, uh, and I had them both sign it. And there was nowhere, and they were in the middle of the room. So I, I just leaned over and they signed it on my back. And that was a great moment. But a little more seriously, in one of these, very often people come up to me afterwards and say, this was fantastic. And I don't mean to toot our horn here. Remember, it's not my work, it's a team. Uh, but they say, how can I get more involved? And in one, in a couple of cases, I'll tell you one story, uh, an engineer, um, military veteran engineer came up to me after this session and he said, that was life-changing. How do I get more involved? And so we arranged for him and his wife to uh, participate in a training we were doing. They learned how to run the workshop themselves. And then they took it out to their church multiple times and started to spread it in their communities. He then changed his career. He left the company he was in, which was a defense contractor, and he went into you know, a career promoting sustainability um, as a full-time major career shift. Who's the, who's the most prominent, like politicians or anybody like that that you've run it with? Uh, well, so we've run it with nearly almost 40 senators, 200 members of the House now, I think about seven or eight governors. Um, John Kerry has used it. The last time I, we did it with him was uh, at MIT just before the lockdown, so February 2020. Um, uh, the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, has used it. Uh, Marty Walsh, Secretary of Labor, has used it. Have you ever had any climate skeptics in the simulation? Absolutely. That have gone yeah. off on you and disagreed with and said it's a load of crap? Yeah. Uh, this used to happen a lot, less and less. I mean, they're just, you know, it's so obvious now. Really, 10 years ago, when I would just ask for a show of hands among our executives, uh, how many of you think sustainability, climate change is a business issue? I wouldn't get more than a quarter. Today, it's 100%. Um, but yeah, I have had uh, deniers. They wouldn't call themselves deniers. They call themselves skeptics. But um, I have had that. And what I have learned probably the hard way is not to argue. Instead, what happens is the other people argue with them, the other people in the room. Mm. Um, and that's incredibly important because you can't win the argument. You're not going to change those people's minds and you run the risk of alienating everybody else. But people are more likely to pay attention when their respected peers, the other folks in the room with them, um, are, are responding rather than myself. This is, of course, an old trick in um, case study teaching, right? You, you're supposed to be Socratic and never give the answer. And instead, just ask another question. Um, and of course, the dirty little secret about case study education, this is a little bit of a digression, but it's important. The Harvard method, a Harvard Business School method for case study instruction is supposed to be Socratic. It's sold to the students that way. Uh, but if you read the teaching notes for the cases, they often include the plan for what the blackboard should look like at the end of the session. Well, you can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't kind of say, <laughs> these are the things that, the points that I'm gonna be making by drawing them out from the students and also claim that you're running a genuine Socratic process at the same time. The great thing about our simulation is it really is much closer to the genuine Socratic process. I don't tell people what to do. And you'll notice, and I, I really want to make sure before we end. Yeah, we got about 10 minutes left. Keep going. 2.4 degrees. Anybody out there, Rod, Patty, 
Randy, anybody out there, give me an idea of what else we can do to get down to two. We can't leave you without. Okay, okay, we, we got to wrap up a few last things here. Um, let's see, can you see the slides? Are you able to see if I, God, I don't know what's going on here, but um, are you able to see this slide right here? Zoom uh, share. Um, versus having yeah. dial. Still the dial. Okay, let, let, yeah, this is so annoying. Uh, let me reshare this again um, and share screen. And let's see if I got that there. Okay, here, I want to just put this up here. This was a, a friend of mine wrote this as an ABT for your overall uh, project. Um, you able to read that? Yep. Yeah, so um, let me read it to you and you tell me, is this, does this capture what you do? Uh, the climate crisis is real and incredibly complex, but policymakers often struggle to see the forest for the trees focusing on point solutions instead of addressing the systems challenge. Therefore, we developed the En-ROADS model to help policymakers explore the broader set of choices, understand their implications, make better decisions on how to reverse stem the impact of climate change. Does that capture what you do or is that missing some details? Pretty great. Yeah, I like it. And um, uh, yeah, it's all about creating opportunities. Can I offer an outsider's detail on that that I think is missing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rod. What struck me really strongly through this is that you you may already do this, this is the first time I've um, seen this, really emphasizing the fact it's not the model, it's people's interactions as yeah. inspired by over right. the model that's critical right. here. And that to me is not in that message. And that to me has been clanging through everything you're saying because right. for the, for the yeah. first hour I was looking at it going well if I was playing with this and how would I encourage other people to do it but if you get Randy's room full of truck drivers from Omaha etc to do this together that's a different story and I think that's have, you, have you done that have you done it with a totally non-academic crowd oh all the time sure and sure. what's the difference there between people that have got graduate degrees actually it's a whole lot more fun with people who don't <laughs> have graduate degrees <laughs> Because I'll tell oh, you what, surprise. Uh, yeah, yeah, surprise. I'll tell you what happens, right? So, you know, we've, we've, and I have to say the politicians are a, a heck of a lot more fun to do it with than their staff. You know, you get the PhDs or on their staff, the climate people, they're great people, but they are afraid to be wrong. This is one of the big problems in academia, right? And, and so they, and this, I'll show them the beginning and I'll explain very minimally, here's how it works, here's what you need to do, and what would you like to try? And they say, well, before we do that, how have you modeled the, uh, the shift between um, electric and liquid fuels? How have you modeled the load variation across the year and the day in the electric power system? And others, they ask all these technical questions that are perfectly good, legitimate questions, but the purpose of their asking them is not because they sincerely want to know, or at least it's not only that, it's because they don't wanna have to make a decision and then see if it doesn't matter. They, they're afraid they'd be wrong. That's the wrong way to think about it. The right way to think about it is, I can try anything I want, whether I like it or not, whether I approve of it or not. Like Patty said, I don't really think nuclear is gonna fly, but let's see what it would do. And then you'll learn what it would do and why. That is a lot harder to get to that interaction with academics. So I love it when we have the uh, non-technical people because they really want, you know, they, I mean, the truck drivers in Omaha, I haven't done, but, you know, with people from working class backgrounds, people in schools, kids, um, they see what's happening in the world and they want to have a better world for themselves and their kids. One of the things we do at the end and, you know, because I know you're going to run out of time here. Yeah. Let's just, and I know people aren't seeing it. Well, I can't show this to you again, but, uh, but let's We've got just, about four minutes left. Keep going. Let's get, let's get to two degrees. So, you know, we've got energy efficiency going. Now we've gotten rid of the coal. Let's electrify transport. Let's electrify buildings and industry. Now we're down to 2.1. Well, let's make the carbon price a little bit bigger. Two degrees. And we've done it without any assumptions about technological magic, you know, fusion power or somehow some magical technology like direct air capture to suck CO2 out of the air. We don't need that. Everything you've got here is stuff we can do pretty much today with what we know how to do today or what we can grind out through the normal process of learning and scale. Okay, up. excellent. Well, talking, speaking of non-technical audiences, let's let the fool have the final comment or question here. Um, Ms. Fool, have you got one last thing you want to offer and then we're about out of time? I think I would 
just say that I lived up to my role because I let this thing, which is not a slide, but which certainly looked like a slide to me, I let that uh, uh, take me over. And I just thought, oh, yes, I've seen those bar graphs, or not bar graphs, the, those, uh, whatever they're called, that kind of graph. I've seen that before. And it's very yep. depressing very static and it predicts the future. And so first I was very thick witted and not, which I supposed to be on the fool. I was thick witted and not getting that, oh, we're about to do stuff and these things are gonna be mobile and dynamic. I didn't really get that. I certainly didn't foresee all those people in the room. Uh, so I thought that I was to be sitting here, if I were going to be participating in this, I would be sitting by myself probably and just moving things around. So I think it wouldn't be the worst thing to, start with the pictures of the people dying in front of Rex Tillerson or something that just, because for whatever reason, I totally, I thought, oh, this is so terrible. The color gray is so dominant and, and it's so alert and it just makes me, it makes, it just reactivates. I guess what I'm saying is you come into this with us having seen graphs of plenty that are just uh, n not moving and dynamic, moving in that all senses and dynamic. Yeah. I got miscued and I did that to myself. I fully had to take responsibility for, for that. But I can kind of see why starting with this, I thought that's great. Gray is the color of despair and all of my choices are gray. Well, and I think things started to get interesting as soon as we realized this was an interactive uh, yeah. the whole game of this project is climate interactive. So, okay, okay. we are out of time. And John, uh, you got a final little thought for us. What, what's the future for this? You got some big events lined up with it? Uh, yeah, well, we're working hard uh, on all levels, policymakers, business leaders, civil society leaders, and the public. We're going to need everybody. The big message from this, you did it here. You've created a much healthier, safer, and more prosperous world. Everything you did can be done right now today in the real world, but it ain't going to happen unless everybody gets up off their rear ends and gets active. So people have to take action personally. <laughs> professionally and politically we can do it there's no time to waste yeah. but we can do it and, and what what's your next big simulation event you've got scheduled oh gosh uh well i can't name the company but the top 40 people in a global company with 600,000 employees uh, there you go all right <laughs> excellent and on that top secret note whatever the company is uh duly impressed and Thank you all very, very much. Uh, this was a fascinating little journey we went on there. And it started with a lot of chaos, but it, it started to take shape and get clearer as we got deeper into this. And I think by the end here, I think the three of us, um, your central audience here, I, I think kind of got it what we're doing. So very, very cool. Uh, uh, Dr. Fool, thank you so much for your participation. You were awesome and <laughs> very valuable resource. Uh, thanks, Rod. Uh, enjoy your semi-lockdown down there. And John, I'll be back in touch sometime soon. Thank you very, very much for taking the time to join us. And everybody else, see you next week on the ABT Time podcast. Adios.